Hi. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the first NCORE Connect and Explore webinar. Uh, my name is Todd Phillips, and I'm the director of the Coordinating Center for uh, NCORE at FHI 360. We're excited that you uh, joined us today, and we look forward to uh, telling you a little bit about NCORE, um, introducing you to some of NCORE's leaders, and talking about some of our funding announcements. Um, if you do have... Um, any technical issues, we do have uh, a chat box right where the arrow is posting. Uh, so if you're having any issues hearing or any other technical issues, feel free to ask a question in that box, and one of our moderators will try to assist you. Um, and that's also the location when we have uh, Q&A and take answers from the audience. If you have questions uh, throughout the webinar, your telephone lines are on mute if you can type your questions in that box, and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible going forward. So with that, uh, here's today's program. Uh, first, we want to highlight a little bit about NCORE. We know many of you uh, may have heard of NCORE, but want to know a few more details about it. So we're going to talk about our first five years of NCORE. Our second segment is focused on one-on-one um, -on -one, uh interviews and topics with uh, four NCORE leaders. So you can hear right from some of NCORE's leaders what their priorities are and what their thoughts are about NCORE. Uh, the third item, um, there are some active funding opportunities for researchers and practitioners. So we're going to present those to you and give you some details on those. And then we're going to wrap up with uh, three highlights from the field, three recent uh, news stories and research studies that have been released that we'd like you to be aware about. So that's today's program. Uh, our spotlight story, uh, for those of you um, who are familiar with NCORE, you may know that we launched in February 20 and 2009. So this February, uh, this month, marks our five-year anniversary. Um, NCORE uh, started back in 2009 with the recognition that at the time, childhood obesity rates had been climbing and climbing, and in the past 30 years, they had doubled among children and tripled among adolescents. So the four leading funders of childhood obesity research really decided that it was time for them to start working together to tackle this issue head on. And so the four uh, NCORE funders and partners are CDC, the nation's leading public health agency, NIH, the nation's uh, health research engine, Robert Wood Johnson, which is the largest philanthropy devoted to health, and then USDA, uh, which is the nation's leader in farming and food. So those three government agencies, along with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, joined together to start undertaking joint efforts in 2009. Uh, the mission that those four organizations uh, focused on was uh, accelerating progress in understanding how to address childhood obesity and while doing so being more efficient, more effective um, by collaborating and coordinating with each other. Uh, they recognize that childhood obesity is such a complex issue with so many factors that only by working together and complementing each other's efforts could they make headway and begin to understand and uh, make a difference. So NCORE, uh, over the past five, five years, has really focused on accelerating uh, dialogue and action, on building knowledge and skills, on addressing new ideas and thinking through new approaches, and then working across the many sectors that have um, application to childhood obesity. So how do we do it? How does NCORE work? Uh, we work by combining what we call uh, four types of capital, um, and we do this combination of capital and flexible ways to do a variety of projects. Uh, so the four types of capital uh, that we integrate, um, I'll start at the bottom. Uh, first are financial capital. That's the, the research money and the financial resources that each of those four organizations brings to NCORE. Obviously, um, you know, research takes funding, and by these organizations, pooling money occasionally or complementing each other's projects with funding, they can make a bigger difference. The second type of capital from the bottom up is uh, managerial capital, and that's uh, the expertise that each of them brings in managing complex research projects. Um, 
the other, the third type is intellectual capital. That's the expertise and scientific insights each of the four agencies bring. And then the last one that was created by these four groups working together is what we call social capital. And that's the relationships, the cooperation, the trust that's been built between these four organizations um, over the course of five years. So in combining these four types of capital, NCOR works on a variety of projects to tackle uh, strategic needs. So this graphic shows you for any one project, um, CDC may give some financial capital and intellectual capital, NIH may manage the project, and Robert Wood Johnson and USDA may provide other types of capital. And we combine them in customized ways and tailored ways for each an individual project to make sure it's being done efficiently and effectively. Um, and as we all know, uh, the past few years have been leaner uh, than in the past uh, with certain budget cuts and scrutiny on budgets. So one of NCOR's big emphasis is making sure that every dollar is used efficiently. Um, we really look at ways to use, you know, combine the four agencies' financial capital in ways that um, boost the impact and have uh, more effect than they would alone. Uh, so this just shows over the past five years, <clears throat> the groups have put about a million dollars a year into NCOR operations, working together, doing strategic planning, developing priorities, uh, forming projects, and implementing them. Uh, over that five years, it's, um, they've invested about $75 million in direct NCOR projects. And you'll hear a little bit about some of those going forward and on our website. And then those projects have influenced uh, more than $500 million in partner efforts that um, have related to NCOR work. So we really realize that every dollar that's been invested in NCOR has really ended up influencing about $100 of activities in the field. So some of our accomplish accomplishments overall in the past five years, uh, the four uh, funders have worked in tandem to manage projects and reach common goals. Um, they've combined funding to make the most of available resources and make them efficient and effective. And they've really shared insights and expertise and learnings across their four organizations to strengthen research, to determine priorities, and make sure that what's being funded is going to have an impact and create understanding. So through these five years, um, NCOR is now a recognized leader by doing innovative, strategic, and effective work. Um, and it's our goal going forward to continue uh, to um, doing this type of work to support research that's going to improve the health of future generations. We've captured a lot of these lessons um, and insights and overview of our work in our most recent annual report. It was just launched yesterday. Um, it's a web-based annual report, so you don't need to find a hard copy. Um, it's on our website, which is at ncore.org, and right now it's uh, the featured item on the front page. Um, and you can also get to it through the Publications tab. But it highlights the um, accomplishments and approaches we've implemented over the past five years. It has some videos that summarize our work and summarize specific projects, as well as some first-person accounts from researchers who have been fun funded through NCOR funding mechanisms. And so um, it's got a great way to summarize our work. It has links to all of the projects we've implemented over the past five years. So I hope you took it, take a look at it, because if you are new to NCOR, it's going to give you a great summary of our approaches and our work. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Elaine Arkin. Um, Elaine is a consultant for both the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the NCOR Coordinating Center, and she's going to moderate a session with um, four NCOR leaders uh, who are all featured on this show or on this slide. Um, so Elaine, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Todd, and, and welcome, everyone. And just to let you know, these what we call one-on-one -on -one segments will be a feature in each of the webinars in this NCORE webinar series. And today we're really delighted to have, as you can see on the screen, Laura Leviton from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Robin McKinnon from the National Cancer Institute at NIH, 
Laura Kettle Khan from the CDC, and Jay Varian from USDA. Um, I'm going to ask them a, a couple of questions, but uh, we hope that you have questions for each of our panelists as well. And as Todd said earlier, um, you can uh, enter those into the uh, chat function. So um, before we start the interview, I just want to highlight one thing. As, as Todd says, NCORE is celebrating its fifth anniversary, and you saw some of the accomplishments of uh, the collaborative and these uh, panelists, the Laura, Laura, Robin, and Jay, are leaders in NCOR and represent uh, in this panel the collaboration that has taken place. So I just wanted to point out about how collaborative um, um, this cross-sector work has been. So Laura Leviton, let's start with you. Can you speak uh, for a moment to NCOR's novel approach and strengths? I'm happy to. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Oh, good, good. Um, uh, childhood obesity is a complex problem, and we all knew that if we were going to make progress and stop the rise in um, rates of childhood obesity, we would have to work together. Um, each of the organizations in NCOR has its own priorities, strengths, and resources. So we decided to work together on strategic priorities. Uh, the sooner we can learn what really makes a difference in reducing childhood obesity, the sooner we can put it into practice. We created efficiencies, uh, strengthened resources and capacity, built the knowledge base, and accelerated progress. And that track record should be evident in uh, the annual report. Uh, NCOR really is a unique example of how federal agencies are working with private funders and with each other to bring synergy and innovation to efforts to address childhood obesity and especially reduce duplication. This is especially important when resources are limited. NCOR gets more done with less. The approach was actually recognized by uh, HHS staff and uh, HHS Secretary Kathleen Sebelius a few years ago when NCOR received one of the inaugural HHS Innovates Awards. Um, as a funder and a taxpayer, I could not be happier about the situation. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. And all of us are taxpayers, so, so we really appreciate that. And So, uh, Robin, I'm going to move on to you. Uh, one of the early successes, one of the priorities of this group at the beginning was creating tools for researchers where there were gaps. Can you tell us a little bit about these very popular products? Sure. Um, so early on, as you say, we, we saw that two of the top areas of needs for researchers was to, to increase the knowledge and access to, to both measures and data to analyze for researchers. And so we created two free online resources that are available at, at ncore.org. And the goal here was really to increase everybody's productivity, to eliminate a lot of the duplication of effort at the front end. We wanted researchers to get to the, to the actual research and, and to um, eliminate a lot of the churn that seemed to be happening and, and this duplication that was happening. Uh, for everybody. And so firstly, uh, the, the measures registry, this is a searchable directory of measures uh, in the areas of diet and physical activity, both at the individual level and at the environmental level. And what I mean by measures there, some examples, it might be accelerometers, and that measures physical activity. Um, measures of diet include things like 24-hour recalls or food frequency questionnaires. Or environmental measures might be survey instruments. And then secondly, with the catalog of surveillance systems, that was our second tool, some people collect their own data for their studies, but there are also many large ongoing surveys with publicly available data. And it's, it, people can combine those data with their data they're collecting, or they can analyze them separately. And we, so in, for example here, if you're interested in physical activity in teens and links to school environments, where would you go to find the data to answer that? And hopefully now 
uh, and we know from from the last couple of years that more and more people are going to the catalogue of surveillance systems. Um, and we've heard from researchers that what used to take up to days, sometimes weeks of effort, now can be they can accomplish that what in in minutes sometimes in locating in in both cases data from the, the catalogue of surveillance systems or measures from the measures registry. We're certainly seeing that the tools are very popular. Um, combined, they have over 2 million hits over the last couple of years. And as I mentioned before, both can be accessed at ncore.org. So, um, Elaine, that's it on tools. Thank you so much, Robin. Uh, and if you haven't, if there's anyone on the phone who has not taken a look at these, please do, because they're um, actually, it's, once you see them, it's hard not to be sucked in and spend some time with them. So just uh, moving ahead, after 30 years of increases in childhood obesity, we're seeing signs of a turnaround in places around the country, limited in specific areas, but, you know, pointing towards progress. So Laura Kettlecon from CDC, what is NCOR doing to try to understand these points of light and help move the progress forward? Oh, thank you, Elaine. Um, I'd be happy to speak to that. Um, actually, kudos to everyone who's on the phone today, making it through any storms and, and kind of delays that you, you've had th this past week. Um, everybody in NCOR, I mean, not just the partners, but even the, the broader field members, are really excited to see the declines in childhood obesity that have been reported recently. Um, they're definitely limited to pockets of geographic um, locations like particular cities or counties. Um, a few states have reported overall declines. But what, what's really um, valuable in, in seeing this is it gives us a chance to actually learn from what those locations have been doing, um, whether they're similar to each other, whether there's differences. Um, you know, just it, it's an opportunity that, that points kind of to the tip of the iceberg of what we're all hoping is a true turnaround. And NCOR in particular has had um, several research efforts that um, are helping document this and assess it and examine it. Um, one one um, study in particular is the Healthy Community Study that's being funded by NHLBI, but NCOR membership has been widely involved in it. Um, if you're not familiar with the Healthy Community Study, it's an observational study of diverse communities um, that's being conducted over a five-year period. Um, if I remember correctly, I believe at this point in time, they're actually looking at somewhere um, above 250 communities. So this is a very large study. The, the focus of the, the evaluation is to determine the associations between characteristics of the community programs and policies with BMI and nutritional practices and um, physical activity in children. It wants, secondly, it wants to identify the community, family, and childhood factors that modify or mediate those associations. And then <coughs> thirdly, excuse me, assess the associations between characteristics of those same policies and programs in the communities with a high proportion of African American Latino and or low income um, residents. The second study that's um, going on is the Childhood Obesity Research Demonstration Project out of CDC. It started in 2011 and it funded only four, it's a, a, more, a more limited study, but it's got four grantees <clears throat> and it aims to improve children's nutrition and physical activity behaviors and the goal is to determine whether an intervention that integrates the activities in the pediatric health care setting with the broader community interventions in schools, early care, and education centers, um, and then how that is helping to improve nutritional and physical activity behaviors that ultimately are thought to reduce obesity in low-income children. The third major effort that's just currently underway um, more recently is the Childhood Obesity Declines Exploring Promises Approaches Project. And this has um, generated a lot of interest throughout the field. 
because it's limited to the locations that are reporting declines in obesity. And so what we're doing is we're following a methodology called the systematic screening and assessment methodology that um, Robert Wood Johnson and CDC developed a number of years ago. Um, and we're, it's a slight adaptation of that methodology because it's, a, a, as the name implies, a step-by-step -step project process that allows you to work through an evidence base that's very scant or uncertain because it has input from experts from the field as well as the experts um, of the study itself. And what we're hoping to accomplish, that at this point we've heard from somewhere between 12 and 15 locations that are reporting these declines. And so we're in the process now of deciding which of those sites we're actually going to go and visit and get, have detailed interviews and data collection or, or documentation um, reviews to find out really what the quality of their evaluation is, what the quality of the data is, um, and, and really hopefully then come back and do some cross-site comparisons as well as individual site um, summaries of what they, the, the, the actual implementers, thought caused the decline. Um, those are the, the three probably most high profile studies. All three of them are written up and described on the NCOR website if you want more particulars or you can just email me and I can um, put you in contact with the main project officers. Great. Thank you so much, Laura. And, um, uh, I know that we are throwing out a lot of information about very large national programs. So for the measures registry, the catalogs of surveillance systems, and also the projects that Laura has just mentioned, you can find more information and, and please share it with your uh, colleagues at www.ncor.org. And now we'll turn to Jay Varian from USDA. Um, Jay, and, and by the way, um, be thinking about your questions for, for the panel and send them in to us. We'll be ready for those um, after Jay speaks. But Jay, we all know, that the, uh, know the importance of the food environment for childhood obesity. Can you talk to us a little bit about NCOR's work related to food systems? Yes, uh, Elaine, thank you. I'll be happy to do that. And uh, we are quite excited about this new initiative uh, that is uh, almost uh, nearing completion, uh, which is uh, filling a gap in the food systems uh, surveillance effort uh, in terms of having better information on uh, household consumer purchases of foods, uh, um, of all manner of uh, food purchases and acquisitions. So uh, there is a, a survey that is jointly funded by Economic Research Service of the uh, USDA as well as the Food and Nutrition Service, uh, and this is called the National Household Food Acquisition and Purchase Survey, and we call it Food Apps, F O O D A P S for short. Uh, and all the information pertaining to the survey can be found at the ERS website, www. ER.ers.usda.gov. So whatever I'm going to say and all the related details are available on that website. And I believe there is a link to that from the NCORE website as well. Uh, so this is the first nationally representative household survey in a long while that collects information on all foods purchased or acquired at home, away from home, as well as through uh, food assistance uh, programs or acquired at a, a school or, or other facility. Now, the survey is completed. The data has been processed. There is some final training up to be done. So there are 4,826 households in the final sample. Uh, and the sample uh, over samples uh, participants in the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance or the SNAP program as well as low-income non-SNAP households. So the survey oversamples low-income overall. Uh, now, the, the great thing about the survey is that it has what the economists call 
the P's and the Q's, that is the prices of the foods purchased as well as their quantities. Now these are collected through m m the most uh, modern technology using scanners uh, as well as matching UPC codes uh, and also through receipts uh, provided by the uh, survey respondents as well as booklets on which they note information about these purchases. Now, in addition to prices and quantities and expenditures, uh, there is also demographic information of the house, about the households, uh, the household composition information, um, uh, the health, some health and nutrition knowledge and attitudes information um, uh, uh, pertaining to the household. Now, in addition, um, a supplementary data set is being constructed which gives detailed information about the household's food environment. In other words, uh, what type of restaurants and other um, uh, um, retail uh, food uh, um, stores are available near the household um, and, and such other um, food environment information. Uh, and in addition, the purchases, uh, uh, the foods uh, that are purchased will be translated to their nutrient content as well as food pattern equivalence using the USDA methodology. So uh, this database at the end will give a complete picture of the nutritional characteristics of the food purchased by the households, the food environment as well as the prices and quantities. Now we have to remind uh, the users that food apps is not a consumption survey. It is not a dietary recall, it is a purchase and acquisition survey. It's not longitudinal, it is one cross-section, and it's not regionally representative. So it is nationally representative. Now, uh, the data uh, will be accessible uh, under strict confidentiality requirements. But the whole data, including this food and environment information, will be made available uh, at the NORC Center, that is the National Opinion Research Center in the University of Chicago. In order to access the data, uh, the users will have to submit a project agreement, um, complete an MOU, and as well as a confidentiality agreement, and take some training in order to comply with the confidentiality requirements. Uh, but, but after those steps, the entire data set will be available for research by access through NORC. Now, as I said in the beginning, all information is available at the website www.ers.usda.gov. If you search for food apps, you will get the required information. Thank you, Elena. Thank you, Jay. That's very exciting. It's going to be a wonderful resource for um, all of us researchers and practitioners as well. So before we get to questions from the audience, um, I'd just like to take a minute for each of you to have uh, an opportunity to preview for the people on this webinar uh, just a, a couple tidbits about uh, what NCOR is going to be doing next. So you heard it here first, folks, and uh, let's start with you, Laura Leviton. Uh, great. So I'm actually excited about uh, some work that NCOR is doing on global lessons. Uh, the U.S. is hardly the only society that is experiencing this epidemic, and an international group of mo people involved with modeling and simulation are taking this on uh, from Australia, England, and the U.S., so they're looking at um, what we can predict and, and uh, a anticipate um, would be some of the more powerful ways to um, affect childhood obesity, um, taking lessons from abroad that might be uh, applied in the United States. Great. That's very exciting. And, and Robin, can you top that? Um, I think I can. <laughs> uh, actually, we were. <laughs> we, uh, the, the thing that I'm most excited about, actually, is um, economics and, and obesity. Uh, of course, there are um, innumerable negative health outcomes associated with, with obesity. 
but um, but also uh, obesity has economic consequences, and so we're working with uh, several folks at the Economic Research Service at, at USDA to drill down into some of those economic consequences. And uh, this is of particular interest to, to policymakers. Um, and so we're looking at a literature review and some, some other similar activities, but more to come on that. That's great. It is a gap, and it's information we all need. As you said, it's so important to make sure that policymakers understand why we need to keep funding in this area. So that's right. really uh, terrific. And Laura Kettle-Kahn, I'm going to turn it over to you. It's, uh, you know, we've been talking about researchers, but there, there are more things on the horizon for practitioners. And there definitely is. I mean, as we all know, the needs of researchers are very distinct from the needs of practitioners, but we really need to work together and recognize each other's needs so that we can better um, move the, not only the evidence forward, but um, also you know, make greater strides in, in reducing obesity. And so there's three things that are uh, occurring. I mean, as I mentioned, we're in, engaging in this Childhood Obesity Declines Project that by looking at those localities where they're reporting success, we're going to learn lots from that. Um, and so we're hoping that those stories and um, can guide practitioners on what to do in a better way um, over over the next couple of years. The the second thing is a collaboration between CDC and USDA regarding their SNAP Ed program. One of the things that has occurred just recently is SNAP Ed has um, been mandated by Congress to expand what they're doing to include obesity prevention. And so the, the, we created a toolkit with um, practitioner and um, or practice-based evidence as well as research-based evidence of interventions in nutrition and physical activity and, and community um, interventions. And then the third thing is, and this is just getting underway, is that as Jay said, there's lots of interest in um, food costs and pricing and placements and, and all sorts of things and acquisition choices. Um, so the NCOR has started a new uh, ad hoc committee called the Healthy Food Incentives Work Group. And what it's going to do is probably um, be a series of um, workshops. The first one is probably most likely, this is all kind of just being decided now, is pulling together practitioners to see what the needs are from the field in this arena. ERS at USDA um, is well underway of planning a summer um, meeting um, on the research that is already known and then in this arena and then um, identifying things that are not known. And then the idea is then maybe in the fall pulling together the synopsis from those two, two workshops to make a plan of what, what is needed to help the whole entire field of healthy food incentives move forward, so it would benefit researchers as well as practitioners. Wow. So uh, the amount of work is really snowballing in both uh, depth and width at uh, Incor. So once again, uh, it's important for everybody on this call to keep checking back uh, the Incor uh, website to, to see what's coming up. So Jay, over to you, and, and one of the questions I want to ask you is, uh, about when the food apps data set is, uh, might be available? Yes, it's going to be available in spring. Uh, that's the date we are putting, uh, March, end of March. Uh, and we are um, trying our level best uh, in order to keep that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that availability open on that time. So uh, there are some, some challenges in terms of some incomplete records and some last-minute discoveries and so forth, but we are working uh, over time in order to fulfill that. So that's our, uh, that's our current uh, deadline. But that's really imminent, so that's yes. wonderful. Uh, it will be available really soon. So, so uh, what else is, is coming up? Uh, well, I'll just fill up a little bit on what Laura just mentioned, the incentivizing helpful food purchases by SNAP recipients. That is a workshop that is an outcome of uh, a joint working group uh, uh, through ENCORE. Uh, we are uh, targeting that for uh, late June and early July. 
um, uh, as a workshop uh, that really looks at, uh, uh, you know, those of you know, um, discuss policy uh, must have heard behavioral economics because it is so much talked about these days, especially with the Obama administration, uh, in terms of using some of these economics and psychological uh, findings to nudge people towards better health choices. Now, this has had a fairly large amount of success in schools, uh, uh, the so-called smarter uh, lunchroom movement and so forth, where uh, by uh, having some relatively low-cost interventions, you can nudge children towards better uh, purchases. So the, the idea is similar. Uh, can SNAP shoppers be moved towards healthier food baskets through some interventions at the grocery stores? So, so that is the kind of the underlying idea. Now, there is a wide body of research in this area that is growing, but can we specifically adapt some of these methods in order to incentivize SNAP participants? So, so that will be the focus of this workshop, and the, uh, uh, from the outcome of the workshop, which, like, like Laura said, will bring, up, uh, bring out retailers, uh, practitioners, and researchers, uh, will be a report uh, uh, laying out some of these options that are available and uh, that can be perhaps be built into guiding SNAP policy. Uh, so that is that's that one. Another thing we are excited about is uh, going back to the food systems. Uh, you know, we we have the one of the national monitoring tools is the food availability data system, uh, part of USDA's effort to monitor food consumption at the national level. Now. Uh, there, there is a associated food loss adjusted food availability system as well which which gets the availability data closer to what what people consume now those two data systems need some updating so we have a workshop uh, that is planned by uh, the um, Commit, national committee on statistics committee on national statistics so under their auspices there will be a workshop of experts who will look at this monitoring system and then how we can take that forward to the next level uh, by building uh, some additional data sources uh, and uh, better measurement methods for food loss. So those are two of the exciting things coming up. Oh, that's terrific and very innovative. And just in case people are starting to think, gee, I have a full-time job, how am I going to keep track of all that? Again, there will be reports from each of these workshops available on the website. So it's really a one-stop uh, shop to, to keep up with all of this. So, uh, Todd, are you seeing questions come in from our uh, audience? Uh, you got the main question about the availability of food apps, and the other have been about accessibility of other, the other Encore tools. So I'll cover that in the next section, and we'll keep moving on. Okay, and I just have one question, other question, which is sort of a, a nice transition over to you, uh, Todd, to talk about that. It says, I registered for the webinar, but otherwise I'm new to Encore. How do I find out more about it? So, Todd, I'm over to you. Happy to cover that. Thank and you so much. And by the way, thank you to uh, everyone on the panel for uh, joining us in the snow today. Yes, thanks so much. Uh, so if you are, are new to Encore and want to learn more, uh, our website is the main source. Uh, we do have a monthly e-newsletter that you can sign up for well as well. And then we have uh, three social media ways to stay in touch with us. One, uh, through our Twitter account, at Encore, our LinkedIn site. And then we have a blog that we update several times a week. Uh, and then the two tools that were mentioned, um, I'll just show you where you can find these. These are our home page. Um, you can sign up, as you can see, the newsletter right on the second level, um, our blog, and then funding opportunities, which is our next topic. Um, if you look under projects, uh, you'll find the pages for the measures registry. Here's what that looks like. And you just click on the uh, red button to search the registry, and then for the catalog, it's the same thing. So through ncore.org and through our social media outlets, you can stay in touch with us and see the upcoming uh, funding or funding announcements um, or outputs from our projects and uh, keep up to date. Uh, and you as well as have access to a range of products and reports uh, that we put out.
So next, I uh, and to keep us moving along, I'm going to turn it back over to Robin McKinnon from NIH, who is going to talk about a couple uh, open funding uh, opportunities uh, for folks on the phone and researchers in the field. So, Robin, back to you. Great. Thanks, Todd. And yes, I just wanted to highlight three funding opportunities particularly for, from NIH. And these are all three of them in the area of policy and program evaluation research, and also policy and environmental change to either increase or improve diet, physical, physical activity, or to reduce sedentary behavior. And might, you might reasonably expect they might have an effect on weight outcomes. And so some examples of effective or successful applications um, to these funding announcements include things like um, a super, the intervention of a supermarket or a food hub in a food desert or public transportation like light rail systems. There's one in Salt Lake City and one recently in, in Austin, Texas and their effects on physical activity outcomes to neighborhood residents or, or building ordinances changes across the country and, or also school environments. So if you look here, we'll step through these three individually, but this first one, this time-sensitive obesity policy and program evaluation, as you might expect, this is a rapid review and funding mechanism from NIH. So we aim to have from the, from the time that the application is received to when the grant is awarded, if people are successful, is three to four months. That's our goal. And so these are specifically for changes that are happening very quickly and, and they need to be changes or policy program changes that are not, in, not controlled by the researcher themselves. So an example might be a policy change in the, at the state level or a local ordinance or even a federal policy change. And then, so I, I, we might leave this one and go on to the next one. The, the point about that one is that it's time sensitive. The next one is that obesity policy evaluation research, this is very similar to the time sensitive version, but uses the traditional NIH review process and, and award mechanism, which is, it, it can be, it's, it, at, at the quickest is usually about nine months, but, but can be 12 months or longer. It goes to standing study section reviews. It's, it's much more uh, traditional in that way and the, the traditional mechanisms. Uh, and then finally, the school environment uh, and school policy, school nutrition, physical activity policies, obesogenic behaviors, and, and weight outcomes. As you might imagine, this, this focuses on, on the school environment there. And um, and so I, information more information is provided on the slides. We'll be distributing those slides. Why don't we go on next to the the helpful resources? If you want more information about NIH grants generally, that's provided here. And these the three mechanisms that I highlighted before. Um, there are many more than those that, uh, available related to, to obesity research from NIH. So that there's a link there for many more funding opportunities related to, to obesity research, as well as the other NCOR partners, a link for the NCOR partners uh, funding opportunities. And we very often get some uh, frequently asked questions um, number one about the, the first mechanism that I mentioned, what does time sensitive mean? And, and here we mean that, that it, it should be very clear that the knowledge gained from the study can't be obtained through the traditional NIH cycle of application, submission, review, and award. Very often if you're doing an evaluation, you need to very quickly gather baseline data and um, that you, the, the traditional NIH cycle may not be rapid enough in order for you to assemble a team, go into the field and gather those, those data. So the, the time sensitive version is, is geared for that process and we need to demonstrate that this is indeed a time sensitive situation. It does not mean that it's time sensitive for the researcher who may be, for instance, up for tenure or something like that. It, it, we're looking at time sensitivity from, from the perspective of the policy or program change. 
Um, and then secondly, why are uh, uh, resubmissions one key thing about the time-sensitive version of, of the initiative is that uh, resubmissions are not allowed. There is only one application with traditional NIH uh, funding applications. One resubmission is allowed. But if it's a, we're looking at a time-sensitive version, because of time sensitivity is, is a key defining factor at this part of this, um, this funding mechanism, so therefore resubmissions are not allowed. If knowledge gained from the study could be obtained in the time it takes to resubmit and be reviewed twice, then it could come through the traditional NIH cycle. So either really either you've only got one shot anyway, in which case you should apply to the time sensitive version, uh, the the uh, PAR or funding opportunity announcement, or you could go through the um, its cousin, the more traditional obesity policy uh, evaluation research program announcement, which is the, the non-time sensitive version. And then um, the, the second main question was about special considerations for new or early stage investigators. And, um, and, and the answer there is that it depends. It, it depends on the NIH institute that you're applying to. And so I encourage people who might be interested in different funding opportunity announcements to go to the funding announcement. And at the very end, you'll see scientific contacts um, from the various institutes that participate in that announcement. And I would reach out to those folks individually to see if their institute provides some kind of allowance for new or early stage investigators, because some, in, some institutes and centers at at NIH do allow some, some consideration for that and, and some do not. So if there are any other questions, we go into the, the next slide, please feel free to uh, reach out to me or also Christine Hunter. And I actually, I think her email address is christine.hunter at nih.gov. There's no HHS in there. Maybe we'll um, update the slides when we send them out to everybody at the end. But also, if there are other questions about NCOR funders, please send them to the, um, to the account listed here. And then I think that's all from me, Todd. Great. Well, thank you so much. I know that uh, obviously funding opportunities are a big uh, interest of NCOR's uh, constituencies and researchers in the field. So um, just a reminder, on our uh, website, we do have the link to the, all the existing funding opportunities from across the four uh, members of NCOR, so you can always uh, find them very quickly and easily from our homepage. So, but thank you, Robin, uh, for giving a few more details on uh, some of the newer uh, opportunities, and especially the time-sensitive one, which we know is a newer mechanism for many people. So thanks again. Uh, to wrap up, in the last seven minutes, we wanted to just give you a few uh, research, uh, recent research uh, releases, highlights from the field. Um, these are the types of studies that we often tweet about or have on our blog. Um, so if you want to stay uh, up to date with the news, you can uh, sign up with us on Twitter or visit our blog. Uh, one of the first ones was a really uh, groundbreaking uh, study of the um, calories that industry has been taking out of the food stream. And Elaine, um, I know you've had uh, a role with this, so why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, this research finding? Sure. So I'm going to move over to my Robert Wood Johnson hat now. And the Healthy Weight Commitment um, Foundation was started um, uh, as a early, uh, it kind of converged with the Let's Move campaign uh, when industry was also thinking about the childhood obesity epidemic and what they needed to be worried about and what steps they needed to take themselves. So included among the many members of this Healthy Weight Commitment uh, are 16 major food manufacturers in this country, Campbell Soup, Nestle, Coca-Cola, uh, Pepsi-Cola, General Mills, so many uh, of the companies that uh, produce the, the food that we have in our households. And they said, uh, we're going to remove a trillion calories uh, on an annual basis from the marketplace 
starting uh, in the year 2012. That's in comparison to the calories that, that they put into the marketplace in uh, 2007. And then by 2015, their goal was to be removing 1.5 trillion calories from the marketplace. Um, and they came to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and said, we're really serious about this, and we're stepping out, and for the first time, industry is going to ask you if you will be willing to do an independent evaluation to find out whether we accomplish this uh, challenge. And so um, you may have seen the announcement uh, last month, um, the the uh, Robert Johnson um, has had a, a grant with uh, researchers at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, headed by Barry Popkin and quite a, an extensive team. And they had to, in order to really look at what was happening from the manufacturer into the household and then eventually into people's mouths, children's mouths in particular, they have combined a number of commercial and public data sets and created really a crosswalk that traces food from uh, a company into a store, into a household, and eventually uh, they will be looking at Haynes data and looking at consumption, again, uh, primarily among children. So. It's quite an exciting project because it's the first time in this country we've really had this kind of uh, tracking possible. And NCOR members, including on this call, um, Le uh, Laura Kettle-Khan and, um, and her colleague uh, Jennifer Seymour, too, from CDC, um, Susan Krebs-Smith from NIH, and Jay, who you've been listening to, among the people who have formed an expert review panel to guide how Barry Popkin and his team put this very complex evaluation together. And uh, they did report that the companies exceeded their uh, goal by more, um, more than fourfold, that they really uh, had removed uh, about four and a half trillion calories from the marketplace in that uh, first measurement year, 2012. What's really, um, I think, most appropriate for the group on the phone is that um, there has already been a publication of the methodology, the design of this surve new surveillance system, this crosswalk, across various data sets. And uh, the researchers have submitted papers that should be coming out this spring that we'll talk in more detail. Uh, well, you know, they, they reduced uh, the number of calories in households, but what are people buying? And, and, and so what kind of calories? And what kind of calories in, in, in households with small children? So the kind of um, application that we all can make of this data is going to be available soon, and it will be uh, promoted through NCOR. Todd, back over to you. Great. Thanks so much. And in just the last couple minutes, I'll just give quick highlights of two other stories. Uh, one is uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and funded by uh, Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development, known as NICHD at NIH. And it looked at over 7,000 children in a nationally representative sample and measured their height and weight seven times from kindergarten to eighth grade to look at the progression of obesity. And surprising to many found out that um, it was, you know, the state of obesity or overweight from very young children was often um, stayed with kids uh, as they grew older and that the state of obesity at around age five um, you know, if you were at a normal weight at that point, you generally stayed at a normal weight. And if you were overweight or very obese, um, you typically, um, the child was still obese at in the eighth grade. So it was a very interesting study that shows that we may have to look at our area of focus, um, which has been typically school settings, um, to potentially some, you know, reaching kids uh, prior to entering school when um, it seems that, at least, you know, obesity and overweight is, is catching, you know, 
um, or taking root uh, earlier in the family setting. So that's a, a very interesting study that has some implications. And then the last uh, quick one is that Yale uh, Rudd Center has always been tracking um, food industry marketing, and they had a report um, in 2012 um, that focused let me get the exact name of it. Excuse me one second. Uh, Fast Food Facts 2013, uh, which was just released, and it's a follow-up to a report that they released in 2010 using the same methodologies, looking at uh, 18 of the top fast food restaurants and how they market their foods and what foods they offer. And while there was uh, some improvement in terms of marketing, they still found that kids see three to five fast food ads a day, um, less than 1% of kids' meals at restaurants meet their own recommendation or um, experts' nutritional standards, and that they've seen this real explosion in social media and mobile device marketing uh, to kids, which is different than what it had been even two years ago. And this is a topic that's of interest to NCOR and that we'll be focusing on going forward as well. Uh, so if you want more details on these highlights, uh, here's our original sources. And again, they're on our blog and Twitter feed so you can find uh, the original sources or read more about them. Uh, we're now at 3 o'clock. Um, there actually aren't any other questions. Uh, so we just want to say thank you so much. Uh, first, to all of the presenters, um, I know all of you uh, work at organizations that are technically closed today. So we appreciate you calling in on a snow day um, and letting us still have this webinar um, as scheduled. So thank you to all the speakers and, and Elaine as the other moderator. Um, and thank you, everyone. I know many of uh, you may be affected by the weather as well on the East Coast, so we appreciate you taking the time to dial in. Um, we will be having three of these a year. And in the uh, link that goes out, we will be doing a survey to get your thoughts on this. So please let us know. Um, if there are other topics or types of activities you would like um, to hear about. And then on the next one in June um, and the subsequent one in the fall, we'll make sure that we're addressing and giving you the types of details and information you would like to see. Uh, so please uh, go ahead and take the survey um, uh, when the link is sent to you. And thank you again. Um, thank you all to uh, the presenters and participants. So. Everyone have a great day, stay warm and safe, um, and we'll have our next one in June. So thank you again.